Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm going to start by doing just a quick audience poll. Um, I can really only see the front row super well because these lights are actually brighter than they appear. So can I just get a quick show of hands? How many people are mostly here to heckle me? Which is, I know it's the front row, so fess up. <laughs> okay. And how many people here have been working from the command line for a while and are looking for like more sort of expert tips or more information? You are going to be disappointed, my friends. This is a very beginner session. So if you sneak out, I see you're sitting at the edges. I will not be offended at all. How many people are here because they are still checking email after the last session? Okay, no, I see no hands because you're currently paying attention to email, no problem. And how many people are actually at a beginner level and every time they've tried to use the command line, they either turn to the whiskey bottle or wanted to breathe into a paper bag or, you are my people, okay, welcome. <laughs> So, um, and how many people just don't put up their hand when asked because they think it's a stupid thing? Great, the same hecklers. And how many people can't understand my accent? Fantastic, excellent. <laughs> well done, everyone. Okay, so today's, um, hi, my name's Emma. I'll be your um, host for today. Um, I've been playing with Drupal for about a decade, I think. And I've been um, working with Linux as my primary operating system with the exception of this computer for about a decade. Um, I don't love living at the command line, but I have definitely made it my home. And I have um, learned to feel very comfortable there by implementing a few sort of tips or ticks, tricks or techniques or those kinds of things. And that's what I want to share with you today is basically how I made myself comfortable at the command line even though I don't really feel like I belong there sometimes. The presentation is divided into approximately four parts. They are not equal length, uh, but we'll start by taking a look at why I think it's so difficult to um, have fun at the command line and really feel like you belong. Then we will uh, talk more specifically about some of the benefits of being at the command line. I will give you the advice to group functionality and map it to things you know. We will use some front-end um, automation tools as our examples, and we'll sort of map them onto, with one exception, map them onto real-world examples so I can show you how you can do that kind of work. Um, then we'll talk about playing the pre-game and learning the moves before you actually get into the real game where you can die. There, I don't play video games at all, but I'm gonna pretend to do video game analogies. It's gonna be hilarious for those of you who do play video games. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about how to not want to throw things at your computer, even though on a fairly regular basis, um, one of my recommendations is gonna be to not get a MacBook Air because they're really um, portable and they're kind of like Frisbee shaped sometimes. Um, <laughs> So we'll go over some of the techniques on how to troubleshoot and just generally how to not panic when you're at the command line. So if you didn't actually listen because that was too long of an explanation, the really big takeaway for today is that the command line is difficult because there aren't any pictures and you will need to make your own. Now, for those of you who are saying, yes, Captain Obvious, there are no pictures at the command line, um, it's, it is an obvious statement to make, but I think it's one that is the true hurdle to feeling comfortable at the command line. As soon as you come to grips with the fact that the command line is never going to provide you with a picture, and that is your responsibility to sketch out, in other words, like get out a piece of paper and a pencil and start drawing out and start doodling and start creating a visual map of how the command line works until you step beyond that hurdle, it will remain a completely impenetrable place. And the big reason for that is because of the way most people think. So if you take a look at either sort of the top two or the bottom two, generally people work with pictures. Now, I'm sort of one of those bizarre folks that like when I close my eyes and picture something, I don't see pictures and I don't see words. I hear some, you know, I hear things, I ha have an audio input, I ha might have music that I hear, those kinds of things, but, but when, I, when I close my eyes, I don't, I don't see things, it's just kind of dark in there. Um, so if you have 
when you close your eyes and you actually have an imagination and you can see sort of worlds inside your mind, you may think that working at the command line is kind of like, and again, for those of you who do video games, my like most sincere apology for all of these really bad analogies that don't quite fit, but it is a um, fog of war experience. I learned that term last night, I was pretty excited. So fog of war is when you're playing a game and the edges of the map aren't defined until you go exploring them. And that's very much what the command line can feel like. You don't really know what's gonna happen until you start typing in the commands and you don't really wanna type in the commands because you're not really sure what's going to happen. And yet, once you've typed those commands, you're still left with pretty much bupkis. So what you need to start doing is figuring out how to create that map for yourself. And I don't, I don't mean to trivialize it but it really can be that straightforward. And for me, that means going back and looking at things from a very, very high level overview. And the way that we tend to teach um, people at the command line is sort of a just-in-time learning. And what I mean by that is, oh, okay, so you want to do this thing, run this command. And we don't stop and say to someone, when we're working in front-end development, one of our goals is automation. And one of the goals is automation because we want to be able to, and I'll go into this a little bit more in, in a few slides, but creating that 10,000 foot view is what makes, for me, working at the command line possible and getting away from just-in-time learning. So I'm going to, um, in some ways, teach you how to ask, so what, and kind of reveal your inner four-year-old a little bit more and be really insistent that people explain to you what the benefits are and what the reasons are behind running those commands and why you should be doing things at the command line. Um, it, um, it also kind of, in some ways, makes our reptilian brain kick in when we're presented with this to look at. And it becomes almost this like rage-inducing, I don't know what I'm doing here, and if I type something, the world might implode on me because I'm not really sure what I'm doing. So the next sort of tip, shall we say, relies on the, the person who was in that slide where I gave you the breakdown of the percentage of people who like to look in pictures or, or think rather in pictures versus think in words. Did anyone recognize the character who was on I think it was two or three slides previous. This is one of those exercises where you're gonna start practicing what it's like working at the command line. Did anyone recognize the character from Sherlock? Does anyone watch Sherlock? Okay, so if I go back, does anyone now remember who this character is, those of you who watch Sherlock? So this character um, is, whose name, uh, it's some, I'm horrible with names. I'm even gonna try and remember. But what he does is he blackmails people and he, oh, spoiler alert. Okay, so for those of you who don't watch Sherlock, um, this is about to get really awkward and you may wanna just like mentally tune out for a second. And I'm sorry if you're watching the video, skip ahead. Um, <laughs> whew, awkward. So this guy, this guy creates a mental palace to store all of the information for which he blackmails people with but he suggests that he has the files and the information. So when people are, are talking to you about the command line and how amazing it is to use and how it's super easy to remember where everything is, they are probably working within their own mental palace. And I believe this is a, a term that dates back to sort of Greek philosophy, whereby you, you map out an environment in your brain I would suggest you do it on paper because again, I don't think in pictures, therefore I can't imagine how other people do this. So if you can create that space and as you walk into the individual rooms, you, you map on how that information works. Now, I'm not going to suggest that your mental palace should necessarily look like a palace, but if you can start to make the connections of where this information fits in, that 10,000 foot view, I think it'll start to um, sort of shift the tide as opposed to the just-in-time learning of like, I'm typing this command and I don't really know why. 
Again, take that 10,000 foot view backwards and then looking into where the individual room is that you're typing the command starts to make sense. So the first thing that we need to start doing on all of this is having you understand why you would even want to be at the command line in the first place. How many people are a little bit resentful every time they have to open a terminal window? Be honest. The rest of you are lying. <laughs> it's actually not a fun place at the terminal. And it only becomes a fun place at the terminal when you start to see some of the benefits of being there. And I would say, um, well, again, if we go back to our sort of four-year-old self and we start saying why all the time, my four-year-old self, um, I have no memory of this, I promise, but apparently what I used to say to my mom was, what's the bribe? So whenever she wanted me to do something, I'd be like, eh, what's the bribe? So you can think about, you know, whatever your four-year-old self would say if you're a video gamer. Is there, is it called, what's the payload? Is that a thing? No, okay, bad analogy. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> um, but, but think of whatever your personal so what is. And I would say that the big goal to be at the command line these days is to gain consistency. And now you should say whatever your inner four-year-old normally says for the so what scenario, how does that benefit me, so what? Well, the so what in this case is that we can now get copy pastable commands. And I would say there's, there's more, it's like all of a sudden one of those like infomercials, wait, there's more. But the first thing that I really love about teaching people version control specifically on the command line is that I'm not having to say, okay, navigate to the third menu, click that down two items, oh, unless you have a previous version installed, in which case it's only, or you have to go down three items, and then a new dialogue window is going to appear, I have to describe in words a visual experience. And if the visual experience changes slightly, then all of my instructions become wrong. Whereas at the command line, if I want to replicate a series of instructions, I can very easily say, here's the sequence of things that I want you to type in. And for me, if something goes wrong, huge benefit in terms of that copy-paste, I can copy the error message and paste it into Google, and Stack Overflow will tell me what went wrong. <laughs> Love that. But if you're working in a GUI, that becomes a lot more difficult. So for me, the first so what benefit in terms of consistency is that copy-pastable part. So what's the advantage? The next advantage of it being copy-pastable Anything that you can type in words, kind of, I lie a lot, is the other thing, you have to watch out for this. Anything that you can type into words is something that you can convert into a script at the command line. And um, again, I'm kind of lying, but if you can issue a command, generally speaking, you can convert that command into a script which gets run. Now, again, your inner four-year-old should be saying, so what, why does that matter to me? because scripts can be automated. So as soon as we can start typing out the commands, we can start creating scripts, we can run the scripts, which means we're making fewer mistakes, and we can also start looking at automation. Now for folks who are working on really tiny websites without huge sort of staging and production environments without the cloud where they have to replicate things times a million servers because they've got whatever thing happening and a million people visiting all at once. Like when I say a million people coming to a website all at once, how many people are like, yeah, I built that. Yeah, there's like three point, you know, as far as, you know, for the recording, about three people put up their hand. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at the logs yet. Whatevs. <laughs> Okay, how many people are like, I got a hundred last week, yeah. Okay, a thousand last week, a thousand in a day, a thousand in a minute. So as you start to grow in size, this idea of being able to automate the pieces becomes far more critical. So I, for myself anyways, I have generally worked on fairly low volume sites. If I make a mistake, oops, Maybe my mom will notice because I told her that I, you know, made a new web page for her. But generally speaking, I'm not doing stuff that's super important. As soon as you start, and, and also I 
don't do a lot of development anymore. I'm mostly on the training side and mostly on the project management side. So as a developer, as you start to build out these systems which get more and more traffic, which require more and more infrastructure, this idea of automation becomes more and more important to you. There's no way if you needed to spin up 10 servers, you would want to be in there apt to get installing every single Linux package to do every single server by hand. You need to put those automation pieces in place. You need to have the scriptable commands. You need to be able to type the commands out, which means you need to be at the command line. So hopefully I've explained to your four-year-old self some of the benefits of being there. The next trick I would say is, okay, fine, you've convinced me that we need to be at the command line. Now I would say your next task is to start grouping the, um, the things that you need to do at the command line and map them onto um, activities that you already know about. So that statement may not quite make a lot of sense yet, so let me show you what I mean. I'm going to group our uh, examples into three separate categories. I'm going to talk about task runners, scaffolding, and package managers. Are there any of those terms right now, um, like, sorry, any of these terms without me explaining them that maybe you've heard before either in a computer sense of the word or in a everyday life sense of the word? Hopefully at least one of them sounds a little bit familiar. Anyone? Do any of these terms look a little bit familiar? Um, shout out, which is the one that sounds familiar or looks familiar to you? Packaging, Packaging? yep, what else? Three. All three sound familiar? Scaffolding, the outside of a building, the thing that you try not to walk into when there's construction happening on the outside. Okay, so these words and where it gets, I think, a little bit tricky is that we use these terms and yet I don't always think that we're using the best English mapping, even though when you get into the technical definition, it completely makes sense. So let's take a look at the first one, the task runner. And I've picked this one first because I think it's got a nice mapping onto, um, onto a real world sort of like, okay, what does this look like if we play out this scenario with human beings? So our task runner in the computer definition of it is a set of tools to make build operations consistent, clean, and well-documented. They provide helpers to manage operations on the project file system via the command line. What? So, task runner, I think of as the ball runner in a tennis game. So the ball runner, whenever things sort of need to be um, um, set back up again, they'll go and get the ball so that we can start playing the game again. So in, uh, in the sense of computer languages, a front-end task runner would be a grunt or gulp, broccoli, brunch. Those words all cluster together. They're all going to be doing the same kinds of things. And if I think about this in terms of a Linux sense, although I'm like, I'm probably the only one in the room who's ever going to map things onto the Linux sense of the word, um, it's a make file for building programs. So now I'm going to work with the next group. I'm going to go through these quickly because I have a comparison chart at the end. So the next one is scaffolding. And scaffolding, design time scaffolding produces files of code that can later be modified by the programmer to customize the way the application database is used. And I think this one, if I give you enough clues, you'll be able to think of a real world example. So if you have a bunch of files that you know you want to customize. If you have a box of Legos that you know you want to customize, this is like scaffolding is like getting a kit. So you get your kit in the mail and you can, or however you buy your kits of Lego these days, and you can make the Darth Vader's TIE fighter, um, or you could, like, decide, your inner four-year-old says, I want to make something completely different. You absolutely are welcome to do that. There's no kit police out there who says you have to build the TIE fighter. So when we're working with scaffolding, 
we're getting a series of things that we intend on immediately not looking like a pile of Lego. Examples of scaffolding. So in terms of my tangibles, my Lego kit is a real world example of scaffolding. I don't, I'm not gonna leave it as pieces. I'm gonna start working with it. Front end development, we've got Yeoman in Drupal. How many people have done front end theming stuff? And you've worked with a base theme? You rarely leave it as a base theme, or rather you copy the starter kit out of the base theme and you immediately start working with it. That's your scaffolding. Um, again, in Linux, make kind of similar here. So if we start taking those concepts and we start sort of mapping them onto commands, we've got the idea of creating an empty shell site or creating a new scaffolding site. So with Compass, you build out all of the template files. Um, with Yeoman, you build out your web app. But it's that idea of what are the building blocks that I'm gonna start with. The third group, package managers. Package management system, also called a package manager, is a collection of software tools to automate the process of installing, upgrading, configuring, and removing software packages for a computer's operating system. Computers, I can't even read this stuff. Operating system, operating system in a consistent manner. Now, I gotta tell you, I couldn't come up with a real world analogy for this one, and I think it's probably because I've spent too much time at the command line and I kind of go, yeah, I know what a package manager is, totes no problem. So can you fill in my blank on this one? Can you think of what, the best I could come up with was like construction site diggers, but that didn't seem very much like install, update, <laughs> and remove. Can you think of what might be a real world example of those three things? Install, update, and remove. What does that in the real world? Like a, um, like a refrigerator installer or something that delivers a, the appliance and installs it and gets rid of the old one. Nice. So a refrigerator installer. They bring you a new refrigerator, they plug it in for you, and they take your old one away. I like that one. Can anyone else, is there anyone that's got something that they can think of for a package manager? So again, these are the techniques that I want you to start using when you're working at the command line of like, what other concept does this closely map onto that I can use in my mental palace for the command line so that whenever I think about this thing, I can be like, ah, this isn't that hard. This is just the refrigerator thing. No big deal. I can handle this. Yes. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just gonna repeat back in for the recording. It's more like the appliance store because I need to be able to choose my appliance from the selection of appliances and then I need to have, like, I, and then I'll go through the, the actual process of doing the installation and having the old one taken away. So going one step bigger. And again, the more you can talk about these mental images and the more you can sort of shape it and say, why doesn't this analogy work? The more you're teaching yourself about what the tool actually does at the command line. And you don't, you don't need to stick with an analogy, but the more you can start to make those mappings, you teach yourself what's, what the commands can actually do. So my examples of package managers, perhaps the easiest one for those of you who are working on a Mac is the idea of the App Store. And the App Store is going to allow you to do all of the things that the refrigerator or the, the appliance store could also let you do. Um, at the command line on the Mac, if you haven't already installed Brew, love Brew, get that. Uh, on Linux, again, it's like, uh, yeah, because nerd. Um, so <laughs> there's package managers on Linux, and I really like them. I prefer the uh, Debian one rather than the Red Hat one. Um, okay, moving on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, did I mention I'm Canadian? Um, so <laughs> that was the apology thing. Uh, and then finally, under the front end development, we've got the Node package manager, Bower, and Ruby Gems. So, some common package manager tasks locate the software, install the software, check if. <coughs> excuse me. Check if updates are available, and also get the latest version of a particular piece of software. 
And these same concepts are going to be repeatable for other package managers. Of course, the syntax will be a little bit different. Sometimes you'll have some double dashes thrown in there for fun. Um, turns out they're important if you need them. But these concepts are going to be ones that once you get to the command line, if you've got that map for them, ah, oh, I'm just installing my refrigerator. It doesn't need to be that complicated. So now I, I'm not going to leave time for you to do this, but if you were to create your mental palace, then you would go ahead and take whatever the generic definition was for each of those three groups of software. Um, I happen to give you tennis as the, the ball runner in the very first example. If you followed that one through, you might have had the scaffolding of the person who sets up the tennis net. Um, or the person who retrieves the ball during the game, or, and then you'll find ways that your analogy doesn't quite work, and then it will get a little bit frustrating while you adjust your, um, the way you think about it or your mental palace to make things fit a little better. But making those connections, diagramming things out, actually, yes, sketching things and writing the words down, doodling, the, the reason why I keep coming back to writing instead of using a computer application is that the, the, the process of drawing will, connect, will make a kinetic connection to the information. So even if you're not um, saving that diagram, that the process of actually moving your hands around, the process of actually manipulating the information, write it on post-it notes, moving those post-it notes around, helps to build the neural connections that you need when thinking about that information. All right, so we've got, we started out with what the benefits are, your four-year-old saying, so what? Then we grouped the information, so we didn't try and learn all of the commands. We started by saying, well, how do those commands, well, how does that program map onto something I already know? The next step is to learn what I'll refer to, again, really bad video analogies that won't actually work. Um, we will go on to the, the pre-game to learn the moves. So I um, recently downloaded, I believe it's called Revolution 60. It's an iOS game and has all female characters. And I actually ended up having a lot of fun playing it. Um, great, great surprise to me and delighted to no extent. My husband, who was like, what are you doing playing a video game? I'm like, shut up. I'm trying to like fight things and stuff. So um, it ended up being a lot of fun. But there's this little thing at the very beginning of the game where you don't die if you do things incorrectly and you like learn how to explore the environment in a totally safe way and you fight a monster and you learn how to oh, like spin and stuff. I don't really, it was cool though. Um, so I'll refer to this as the, the pregame part of the show. And the first thing that I want to tell you about is what I think makes a really good command line utility. Because I think there's some really, really horrible ones out there. So I would say, for the most part, a command line utility that makes me feel smart is a good command line utility. Um, like, disclaimer alert, Git does not make me feel smart. Um, so <laughs> just putting that out there. But I've, you know, I, I learned how to use it. I use it on a daily basis. I'm writing a book about it. Um, and I, I like what I can get out of it, so I'm willing to put up with it. So the first thing that I look for is the help command. And I want to see that it includes a functional list of the um, subcommands that I can run, not an alphabetical list. So I want it to be giving me some tips right off the bat. Um, if it doesn't do that, I can immediately start to blame the developer of the application instead of myself. Because they've not given anything to me in terms of a few tips to get me started. So I can immediately start to sort of like absolve myself of blame when things don't work right away. The next thing I really like a command line application to do is give me output. If I'm going to go to the hassle of typing something, I want it to give me something back. And some applications at the command line, you type something in, and by design, it doesn't say anything back at you. It doesn't say, well done you, or you've done it wrong again, or anything. It just kind of like silently succeeds, fails, I don't know. So I like a command line to give me information back. Um, and then the next thing that I really like a command line to do, and Git is actually really good at this one, is I like it to tell me what to do next. 
So when I've performed an action, I like it to make suggestions on what I might want to do as a follow-up. So some quick tips for navigating at the command line. Um, this is um, sort of moving around your environment. Arrow keys up and down allow you to uh, navigate through your history of commands. Typing the word history and pressing enter, and um, I should clarify, this is at, the, at a bash or a, a one of the other variants. This is not necessarily in Windows. Um, I'm gonna have a slide for what you should do if you're at Windows a little bit later on. Um, so typing the word history will give you, for that particular um, environment that you've got opened currently, a list of everything that you've typed previously. Super, super helpful. If you want it to retype one of those commands and you don't feel like arrowing up 50 things, you can type the exclamation mark, the number from the line in the history thing that's just been output, press enter, and it will retype that command for you. Super helpful. The other thing that I really like is Control R, and Control R allows me to search through the history in a reverse fashion. So three just like little pre-game things for you. Then within the actual command that you're typing out, again, sort of navigation tips, when you're typing, start hitting tab. What tab will do is either complete the command, complete the file name. Um, if it knows more things and can make guesses, pressing tab will start hinting at what might be available to you. If you want to delete a word, control W, jump to the beginning of the line, control A, jump to the end of the line, control E. These are really handy if you um, have a super long line that you need to make some adjustments to. If you're working on a Mac like I am and you can't get your little pinky over to control very easily, you can remap it onto the shift locks key um, or caps lock key rather, uh, which none of us should be using anyways in this modern age of not yelling on the internet unless you're working in the issue queue. No, I'm just kidding. Um, just checking to see you still paying attention. All right, so finding the command line, we've got our navigation tips and tricks here. Um, in theory, all command lines should be created equal. In reality, they're not. I highly recommend using Vagrant if you're on Windows. Um, is Erica here? Mm, Erica's not here. Erica has written a really fantastic book on how to use Vagrant. And um, I also have some videos up on Drupal Eyes Me. Uh, some of them are free, some of them are not. Vagrant allows you to create um, an instance of a Linux server on whatever your current system is. So if you are on a Mac or if you're on Windows or even if you're on Linux, uh, it ties in with the Oracle VirtualBox. It also works with uh, VMware now. So you can put a, an, another instance of a machine. I generally, um, I again, because I like working inside Linux, the other thing I like about this is it kind of feels more secure. So you can sort of play with things and then destroy the machine if you decide that you don't want it anymore. And I have to say, destroying machines in Vagrant is kind of cathartic. So <laughs> back at the command line again. Hopefully not as rage-inducing now that we've got some ideas of where we're going to be heading. Um, but we need to figure out what the inputs are going to be. And again, if I come back to the ideas of games, I've got this idea of a prompt that I'm starting with. And the prompt is asking me to, to move or to take action. So if we were working with the old um, logo turtle thing that, is anyone old enough to remember these like horrible computer games that we were supposed to be really excited about as 10 year olds. Okay, I'm seeing a few giggles, but not many. So, <laughs> um, like the turtle walked around the screen really slowly. It wasn't that exciting, kind of like the command line. Um, if you have done text-based adventure games, you open the mailbox. These are things you do at the prompt. We type in commands. This can be either thought of as a verb or a noun. Commands might be one word actions like sing or jump or look at the actual command line. I might say help. If I want to get the heck out of there, I type exit. It will close the command line. Or history, which is one of the ones that I mentioned earlier to give you a list of everything that's happened. In terms of the next step in our evolution, I initially just had take, read, open. 
To that, I've added a parameter. So I can take my book, I can read my pamphlet, or I can open my window. On the um, actual command line side of things, I can change directories into a specific directory. I can read the manual page for whatever the, the command is, or I can move, this one's tricky, degree of difficulty just increased, I can move one parameter and then there's a second one in there. So I can uh, move one file name to another file name or move it in location. I can also add in modifiers, and this is where we often start seeing dashes, but they're not always dashes. Flags will have a double dash. So when we start adding in, this is going to represent a collection of, sorry, let me start that sentence again, with a parameter, we've just got in the whole concept. With the modifier, we're going to be telling you something about the very next word. So in uh, my exam, my first example of make directory, I'm saying and its subdirectories with that minus p flag. When I've got my tar, I'm going to be assembling files, or in this case, extracting files with the X, um, and the, the file that I'm going to extract is then provided. So we've got a couple of different layers that can be provided at the command or within the command itself. 10 commands that, <coughs> that I use fairly frequently. When I first started working at the command line, I actually had a help file that had the things that I did on a fairly regular basis, and it was um, all in capitals called help. .txt, uh, and it lived in my home directory, and I referred to it all the time. And whenever I, because in those days I would like email one of my friends, and be like, hi, I don't know how to do this thing, and they would email me back this like amazing command that had words like said and awk in it. Um, and I would like paste the email and I would put it into my help file. So I recommend this to you, create your own mental palace or just text help file. If you want a list of all commands, one of the things that um, I found when doing research for the very first version of this talk a few years ago was a command line foo.com slash command slash browse. It's not only a list of all the commands that you can type, but it has a rating function. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, actually. Um, or just doing an image search on Google for commands and finding a cheat sheet that you can print out or you can have as your desktop ref or your desktop background for a while. Those kinds of things will help to expose you to the different kinds of commands, but it's very much a just-in-time learning. So it's not helping you to create the map of the relationship between what you need to accomplish and the things that you need to type in. Oh, finally here, it'll be okay. You don't need to panic. When things happen at the command line and output is presented, hopefully output is presented, my big tip here is to read that output in both directions. And I know that sounds like kind of a, a strange suggestion to make, but it's kind of like look both ways before you cross the street. So the reptile brain, when presented with the output from Git, freaks out because it says detached head. And I gotta say, detached heads are pretty frigging scary. So if I read this for, as if it were a sort of normal command output, the way that I've trained my brain to read at the command line is to look, um, I guess, oh no wait, I've got a fancy laser pointer, you guys. Check this out, okay. Okay, whew. So my normal reptile brain goes to the very closest thing to um, my input. And I've, I've clipped it out on this picture, unfortunately, but the, you know, the next thing would be the prompt at the bottom. So the, I go backwards in time and read, head is now at something, something. I don't really know what's going on here. Okay, I'm gonna go up one more. Okay, I'm supposed to do a Git checkout. I don't know what's going on. I'm gonna go up one more. And I read backwards through the information. Git is actually, as I mentioned before, really fantastic about telling you what to do next. So in the case of Git, you actually want to read top to bottom, and it will give you clues on what to do next. But if you're reading the output of a command, you actually, or 
the the build information if a if a task runner has gone through and completed a bunch of steps for you all it's been doing is sort of spitting out to the screen what it's been up to as opposed to presenting you with instructions so in the case of I was doing some things and then it broke in that case you're going to start at the broken bit and look at what it did just before it broke so I, I present you with this slide. In the middle, it says read outputs in both directions. So now you can either choose to go backwards or you can choose to go forwards. And when you're working at the command line, you've got that same kind of decision that you need to make. You're presented with some output, read it from the top, and if it's like thousands of lines of scroll that's gone past, probably just start reading from the bottom and see what it said last. But do check from both directions. I've gone through sort of a bunch of different ways of looking at the command line and um, gave you some examples of how commands get structured. I gave you some um, groupings for front-end development tools and how you may want to map them onto specific places. And this, for some of you, will be a little bit of a frustrating presentation because I've not actually shown you how to do anything at the command line. And now this is, this is going to be awesome for me because I didn't tell them ahead of time. So in the front row, we've got self-identified hecklers who actually know how to use the command line. I see at least four of them who are now all like hanging their heads and like crying a little bit. So what I'm going to do, I think we've got like 15 or 20 minutes left, is I'm going to suggest that perhaps my friends who came to Heckle might be willing to help us out a little bit. And for those of you, I've got a, a summary slide that I'll do here in a minute. I just want to tell you where we're going with this. The answer is search Google. <laughs> it always is, actually. But you have to know what to put into Google. So, <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, for those of you who want an actual hands-on part, you probably have different things that you want to learn about. I'm not going to put it into the recording, but we'll group you into like, are you a front-end person? Are you a developer? Are you a project manager who's just like trying to figure out what's going on? Are you a designer who's really kind of angry at the world right now? Or maybe you're really excited and it's all awesome because you're in Amsterdam. We're going to, um, I hope they'll agree to do this. I want to show you some of this stuff in practice and answer some of your questions in a more like intimate fashion in the sense of not having it recorded so that you don't have to worry about someone hearing your question later. Um, so we went through four different parts and I, I think they're going to be game for this so that's good. I started you by by saying, I started off by saying figure out how this is going to be of benefit for you. Nurture your inner four-year-old and start asking, so what and why, until you can get to the point where you actually want to be at the command line. The next thing I recommended was to group functionality and map it onto things that you already know about. Get out those sketchbooks, doodle, create the neural pathways, make actual physical actions so that you don't feel trapped inside the command line. Your reptilian brain, at least, maybe I'm projecting, my reptilian brain takes over when I can't figure out what to do next. And so the more that I can take a step back away from the information and talk myself through the 10,000 foot view of what I'm trying to accomplish, I can come back into the command line. Unlike those war of fog situations, just because you've exposed something on the command line doesn't mean it's going to continue doing that horrible thing until you come back and fix it. You can just leave it there, you can put it in timeout, come back, understand what you're doing, draw the picture of what you're trying to accomplish. The command line will be there for you when you get back. Learn the, the, the pre-game moves, shall we say. So figure out you know, whether it's how to navigate or um, generally what the commands are that are available to you, whatever pre-game means for you. Figure out some of that stuff before you get into a mission critical like, oh, I really have to do this now. Um, not really sure how to navigate on the command line. And finally, it will be okay. You don't need to panic. The more that you can turn off that reptilian brain and the more that you can ask questions and put things into Google and have people available to you to answer those questions, suckers. I mean, thank you, my helpful friends. <laughs> um, the more that the command line will be just another tool that you're using. So 
thank you very much. Hopefully I've given you, um, if not some information to get you going, hopefully I've shown you that it's okay to be stubborn and um, insist that it be explained to you in a way that makes sense. So yes, please go fill out the evaluation, um, but I'm also going to sort of break this up now a little bit and um, get your actual questions answered. Thank you very much.